Um, all right, cool. So I'm going to talk about lean user research. So I used to be a design researcher and kind of segued over to UX and then product design now. So I'm going to talk, and I actually started off at a bigger company. I'm now at a startup. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you make that case for design research when you're in this environment to ship. So call me Saj, like Corsage. <laughs> it's pretty easy to remember. Um, I uh, went to school over at the school called the Institute of Design, where I met Amir. Um, that's where I studied design research, design strategy, did a whole bunch of very like fluffy grad school kind of work. We actually built a framework for Yahoo, which was how to design with meaningful value. Um, and then afterwards, I actually segued and did some work over at Yahoo, kind of kicking off doing uh, ethnographic design research, um, and then segued over towards hands-on design, doing UX design for Yahoo yeah, Finance for a while. Um, since I've come over to Jute, to Jute where I am now, um, it's, and where startups is working on big data platforms uh, for operations analytics. So um, right now I'm doing a whole bunch of UX design for these guys. We've got this really specific user base, which are DevOps people. Um, we're trying to kind of pitch this new way to deal with your data where you get to keep your data, and we're really just focusing on uh, making it in a way that it's easily manipulable with code and approachable for people that like to code. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, and since I've come over to Jut from Yahoo, I've really noticed that, well, we're three, three designers inside of a house of 40, so we have about 35 developers, so not a whole lot of design resources on our side. I'm in charge of the interaction design and the design research. So um, just trying to figure out, well, first of all, we know we need to get in front of users. Uh, we know I have a really specific user base. How do we make the case that we need to spend time getting out of the office and actually talking to these people? So that's what I wanted to talk about today. So I usually kind of kick off this with this question, like where do our design problems come from? So for you guys, where do you, where do you guys start, kind of start off with your design problems? Usually? Come from like CEOs or? It's a pretty ambiguous question lots of times, right? Like it can come from users ideally, or maybe you have like a technological breakthrough and then you decide you want to bring it to market in some way. Um, an easier question, so how do we know when we're not, we're not solving our user problems? Well, that's usually when you have something out there. And so I think teams lots of times know the answer to this, right? You've got like data, right? Like you're gonna see click-through rates or something. Something's gonna tell you if something's not working. Um, really powerful stuff. Um, and I think there's a movement towards growth hacking, which is totally instrumenting the things you're making, so you know when something's not working. The tougher question becomes, well, how do you understand why we're not solving the user problems, right? So that's when you have to start digging in deeper. So if you look at like a lead startup process, it kind of looks like this, right? You have somebody that comes up with some sort of idea. You go through and you kind of make some sketches of it, storyboard that thing. Uh, you bring it out to the real world, you've got this shiny little box. Um, you take that thing, you throw it in an epic, you start making it. Um, <laughs> Take that box, bring it out into the real world, show it to some people, see if it works. Um, you get a whole bunch of data back, and you kind of start the cycle over and over, right? This is uh, the lean startup methodology, right? Measure, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, build. Um, and it's really gay, great when you're meditating on a problem, right? You've got a big, juicy problem, you know what you need to solve. Um, the problem I think can come in is, well, what problem are you solving, right? Like, awesome for solving problems, you just need to make sure you're innovating in the right direction. So, um, example everybody knows about, right? You guys seen one of these guys? Has anybody ever actually written one of these before? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, so like they're great for like city tours. I think they're killing it with these things. Um, but <laughs> the big problem is like nobody really took into account. I mean, everybody's with the story, right? Like writing these in the outside world's a little bit awkward. You're like, have you ever tried to like shake hands with somebody on a subway? It's just like this. <laughs> um, Bonus points for anybody that recognizes this logo. Hello. Boom. There she is. So these guys, had, I think it was like $150 million in funded um, for this social media app. Um, this was the founder's quote right after this, which is like, that we had a whole lot of smart people in the room again trying to make something. They made it, but um, then they realized as soon as they launched it, it wasn't the right thing. Um, and I think this happens pretty often. So. Knowing that this happens, well, what can you do if, you, if you're trying to figure out what that problem is you want to solve? Um, 
the other alternative is you start with the user, right? So it's Kyle, and this is our, our DevOps user with this nice little neck beard going on. Um, <laughs> and so when you have a product and you're, you're, um, you're presenting it to someone like Kyle, you're able to see things like, like click-through rate, his how many unique visits he's making, his heat map of the page, all this great data. Um, but the problem with all that data is it's, it's kind of like, you can think about it like if you're sitting here in front of Kyle and you decide you want to make him a burrito. So you make this burrito and you give it to Kyle, and Kyle's like, nah, this burrito's not very good. So then you, like, you take that burrito, you put some sauce on top of it. So like, hey, Kyle, I've got this new burrito for you. It's got sauce this thing. All right, so you give it to him. He doesn't like the burrito. So then you like put some sauce underneath of it. It's like a mole burrito this time. And <laughs> he's still not digging this burrito at all. Um, and so the problem is, like, Kyle just wanted some apple pie. But, like, you're never going to figure that out by just giving him burritos after burritos, right? <laughs> so, we just, we just want some pie. So, and I think this happens all the time, right? Like, when you take a, a website and you optimize it, you optimize each little section, you come up with this great little monster. Um, <laughs> you kind of lose, um, you kind of lose what the focus was of the whole right. thing in the first place. So this is kind of like that notion of, um, innovating in the wrong direction. So Tomer Sharon, uh, total hero of mine, talks about this notion of too many times people ex <laughs> perfectly execute the wrong plan. Um, okay, so now that we know that, how do we get closer to perfectly solving the right plan? And I think a lot of product teams, like product people, dev people, designers, have a really great instinct for this, right? Like you go out there and you talk to users, right? Like that's what you're supposed to do. And uh, it kind of works. Well. Let's get back to Kyle. So right, what we want to do is we want to like, we really want to get inside of his head, right? Like, we want to know what's going on inside of there. Um, and so we, we go out there and we, we talk to our users, right? This is, the, the right? this is what they always say to do. Lean start. Talk to your users. Great idea, right? Get out of the building. Everybody's talked about this before, right? You go out there, you show your product to, to kind of like, yo, I'm making this thing. Do you like it? You're like, yeah, I totally like it. Like, who hasn't done this? But then the reality of it is then like, you go back and he actually uses it. He's never going to use this thing, right? Because you're sitting inside of a lab when you're showing this thing. Um, and I think there's like a really, it's like a common scenario. It's like there's what we say and what we do. So if I ask everybody here what kind of coffee, like most people go and they say, I'm like this deep, dark, robust coffee. But in reality, like most people just like their coffee kind of light. Um, and it's just the difference between what we think we want to do and what we actually want to do. So we're, there's, um, Daniel Kahneman has this great quote that we're just these, we're horrible at predicting our own future behavior. And that's kind of this problem with talking with users. Okay, well, so we know we need to start with the users. We know if we talk to them, we might get bad information. Well, what do we do? Let's go back to Kyle. Alternative, as we all know, is you go out there and you actually watch Kyle in his natural environment, doing what he normally does, um, whatever that environment might be. <laughs> and that's what we call user research, right? It's just understanding the needs, uh, behaviors, and motivations of people through all this stuff that we call our profession. Um, and what's important to note is when you're, when you're trying to understand, like, how can we help people understand that this is an important thing, is, is that lots of companies that make really incredible things um, find this is a, a really important field that they hire people specifically to carry out. So these are some Apple job descriptions. And more and more, even inside of small organizations, you find that people are finding this as a profession that's important, that they need to integrate with the rest of the teams. Okay, cool. So we know it's important. We have a general idea of what we should be doing. Okay, so well, how the heck do we actually do that? Um, so I like to think of like traditional user research as like this sandwich. Um, where it's like it's a little easier to imagine if you sit on its side. Like, <laughs> you kick off, you got like, you understand the problem, right? You go out there, you do ethnographic research. Um, these are ideas of the world that are great for this. Um, and then you have the tail end, you go and you make something, and then you start to figure out if you're solving that, that problem correctly, that's usability. Um, I think this is a really powerful process for industries where you have really long cycle times. So I think automotive industry, CPG is really great for this because you have such a long period of time between when you start with an idea and when you launch it. And when things are moving faster, this can start to break down because it ends up being so slow. Um, so when I think of lean user research, I like to think of it as like a, a sloppy joke. <laughs> so <laughs> stick with me guys. 
So you still, you're still doing these same things, right? There's like understanding the problem, and you're trying to understand how to solve it better. Um, the key though is just letting it be okay that this process can get mixed up. That some of that understanding of the problem happens at the same time if, when you understand if the things you're doing now are correctly solving that problem, if that makes sense. Um, I saw this quote out here in the hall that I really liked, no chaos, no creation evidence the kitchen at mealtime. Um, yeah, I think this is like, a, a, when I think about design research and how I've done design research in the past at bigger companies, there's like a little bit of an antisepticness to it. And I wonder if there's not room for us to get comfortable with it being messy and uh, mixed in with the design process itself. Um, so that's where this notion of lean user research comes in. So um, it's kind of three tenets, I think, if you want to try and make research work in a territory where you know you have to ship and you have to get stuff out there. Um, the first is just understanding that it's not a big deal. Like, you just back it off a little bit. It's, I think ethnographic research is great. The word ethnography is just this, like, I mean, I, I learned what it was because I went to grad school. But are there ways that we can unpack that a little bit? Um, we all smell users. So to the point of making sure that you have your developers, you have your PM teams out there. Like the key part of making research work and not making research documentation work is just cutting out that communication between you and the people that are shipping this product with you. Um, and lastly, possibly most importantly, like there's still a methodology. There's still this thing called moderation that you have to either do yourself or be able to share with other people so they can properly do it as well. Um, it's kind of the goal of this, isn't it? Can we just make research a little bit lighter? It's this thing that we do, because we are people that are also shipping the things we're making. Um, and on that note, I also have these five simple ways to get better data from our customers. And this is kind of in the spirit of um, teaching other people what design research is, as opposed to keeping it in your own domain. But I want to be respectful of time, so. It's, it's fine. Uh, you still have two minutes, actually. Two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give you five ways to get better uh, data with Kyle in two minutes. So um, first up, this one's a little bit contentious, but don't listen, watch. So um, this is a great quote from Dan Gilbert. People are great at overestimating their reactions to what I have to events. Um, and I think this happens all the time when you start trying to talk to users. Is you get this thing called, would you ever buy? Would you ever use this thing? Would you ever do this thing? We're just bad at predicting this stuff. And I think it's really great um, as like research theater, like it feels really good because it feels like you're doing stuff, but it's like really bad research theater. Um, and there's this issue where like people wrongly think that they're better at understanding themselves than they actually are. Um, so what you really want to do is you just want to be watching people um, doing things as opposed to rationalizing the things you've done. Really great, easy thing to teach people as you're trying to share how to do research. If you can't do that, you want to get people telling stories. So as opposed to, would you ever tell me a story about the last time? So then you get these great stories about how Godzilla monsters attack their MySQL servers or whatever. Um, and these are like, it's great because stories get to something that is recent and very specific about things that you can analyze with your team. All this is there in context. Make sure that you're going out there and looking at this little beautiful graph inside of the context in which they're actually using it. And there's a passion amongst the world of product management for these things called features. Um, and I think they're great things. Right? There's, there's something that we want to get to. But I think the, the power of understanding feature requests is understanding why they're making that feature request. And backing up from the feature itself uh, to that motivation, I think, is a key to, to really understanding um, understanding your users. So if there's like, there's like a fiery pit of user research and there's like the heaven up above, I think would you ever is like in the depths of hell down there. Um, <laughs> and then watching behaviors like up at the top, that's awesome. Um, and then just below that's like, tell me about a time. Um, and then somewhere in the middle is what features you want. And I think that's because when used poorly, they're, you just react to them and you give people the features they ask for. When used well, you interpret them to understand the motivations for those features. So when you get those feature requests, um, I think a great thing to do is just to start digging in and trying to understand what problem is that feature trying to solve. Um, and if you can find, and so that's, people think that's a bowling ball all the time. It's supposed to be a person looking at that problem. <laughs> um, so if you can try and understand that problem, then I think you will get to a better feature that will work for a larger group of people. Um, 
three simple things to watch out for. Um, what routines and rituals are people are doing on a regular basis? What are those little things that interrupt them on a daily basis? And what are those little in-between transitions? Um, lastly, just get out there and watch five to six people using your product. This is a contentious number again, it's pretty small. I think the great thing about it is it's starting to get into the world of significance, um, where you hit about 80% of the problems that you see, but it's a totally approachable number. You can talk to five to six people in a day. Um, and I think if you start kicking off and sharing kind of these five simple ways to get better feedback, <coughs> then you start dipping into this world where you have a messier design research process that gets you closer to shipping. Um, I, I did do this. I um, I think there's a great thing that Apple talks about, which is um, there, there's a thousand no's. And I think a really important thing to, to kind of communicate with developers on your team, if you are a developer yourself, you probably know this, that um, it just sucks being wrong. Um, and it's scary to be wrong. And that's, that's some of the fear of showing your products to people is just this fear that I mean, most of the time you are just going to be wrong. That hurts. Um, so I think that if you do design research Better, you can instead of falling in love with this beautiful thing that you're creating, if you fall in love with a problem, you nail that problem, um, and you're not wrong about the problem as often, um, you can start getting to better solutions. That's it. Thank you. I think it was Edison who said, I didn't make, I don't know, thousands of mistakes, but just thousands of ways how it doesn't work. So it's not really a mistake, but he found out, okay, that's, that's a way, but it just doesn't work that way. So uh, just look it from the bright side. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was when somebody asked me, asked him, uh, how do you feel about failing 1,000 times in a row? <laughs> you can tell, I didn't fail, I just found out a way that doesn't work. Question? So does this work for you in your, in your job, in your company? Yeah, um, I think we're getting it to work. So I've been at Jeff for about six months, um, and we do, we just have, make sure we have some sort of user touch point every two to three weeks, every like sprint or two. Um, and what I think the thing that makes it possible is like we mix in like we're doing like beta launches right now, like those beta launches become usability tests as well as carve off a section of a graph that just kind of mix it all together. I think it's an interesting perspective, you know, the good clean research versus the scrappy messy research good enough research and that's there's always a tension there because there's always a good set a, 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 you know set of people that want the good clean research with the proper report out and that you know that you can forward to a thousand people whereas you know how much do you absolutely need to know in order to move the product forward yeah. I think there's an inherent tension there that's a good call there's there's like the the, the, the dangerous part is losing the methodology for so like doing this properly um, the question for me is always that in that case like who needs to see this in order for us to ship? And what's our final deliverance? It's usually a product that's a final deliverance. So, do you do, uh, do you use group hacking? And if you do, how do you balance it against uh, new tools that work so well? Yeah, so um, we have our, our data analytics guy. He's in charge of our growth hacking team. Um, and right now we're still in this kind of early pre launch phase, so it's really What's happening is I like to call it a quantitative qualitative sandwich. So there's like quantitative up front to figure out what's happening, qualitative to figure out why it's happening, and then the quantitative to re-instrument according to those whys. So that's how we kind of sandwich those two together. How well it works? So far so good. Um, yeah, I mean we have to, so we're still in beta right now, so I'll have to report back to you throughout the wild. Did you do any, do you have any similar experience when you were at the app? Um, no, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's a big a big issue was uh, quantitative research was really separated from um, ethnographic qualitative research. Um, and I think that there's almost like a competition between the two, uh, which is really unhealthy. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, the two are just so complementary. Um, and it's, I think if you can accept that, you can probably get it out there. Super cool stuff. Totally. Um, I think there's almost a danger to being too academic because it slows down the research so much by the time you get the results, it's like, oh, that ship has sailed. The decisions have been changed. <laughs> it's like, well, why did we just do this, right? Yeah. Um, so, like, personally, I just go for it. Like, if they want, you know, super statistically significant stuff, commission a market research mm -hmm. thing, tell them it's going to come back in a year. 
and then go get like the product <laughs> stuff that they actually need to, to inform themselves. Um, the Android team also does something really weird where sometimes they like hold up and they don't even submit reports because if you're not there observing the study and you're not participating in discussions at the end of the day, like you do not have a say. Mm -hmm. Which is an interesting tactic. Yeah. Yeah. We, should, we should have that here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, for that. gets no write up, right? Just decisions at the end. Derek Spoon talked about the exact same approach, and I think he implemented it at Amazon that um, from the very beginning, if there is a research study, they would ask, ask sponsor, whoever was executive sponsor, that he or she would have to come in to at least watch a certain number of um, studies or sessions, otherwise they would not share. And ultimately, throughout Amazon, they, they stop doing research readouts. Just come watch. Otherwise, it could be shipped to product team. They would be told, like, you know, okay, this is what we did, but no readouts. It feels like it's just like, it, I mean, it's really about community. It's like empathy, right, is what you're trying to shoot. Like, we are in a room together, we understand um, how we're interacting with each other. Like if you, every degree of abstraction from that, you're losing some degree of empathy. It's like looking through this interaction through Coke bottles after Coke bottles after Coke bottles. So, so we do research, we iterate on design, research again, iterate again. Uh, let's say that this is the ideal loop we have. Um, in your experience, uh, what what yielded better results? Falling flat or just stumbling and then it 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 should say more about falling like, flat. Uh, you mean like full that, on pivots versus iterations, incremental iterations? Like let's say that you went into a research study uh, with like a user validation let's say, with strong assumptions uh, and you know, this design solution uh, created based on those strong assumptions. And it just fell flat, it didn't work at all. Versus it kind of worked, but you know, still not quite there. Yeah. So which one yields, which one of these scenarios yields better results mm -hmm. in the next iteration? Um, I, if, I, if I understand the question correctly, it feels like there are two two different outcomes from a similar kind of presentation. Like in some cases, things will fail flat, and they fail flat and start over. Other times, they'll be slightly off, and you make modifications to it. Yeah. So I think you're asking, like, is it better for something to, do, to just totally bomb or sort of do OK? And I think it just it varies yeah, depending exactly. on what the product is. Like, I, I can't say that failing miserably is better than <laughs> failing. Like, honestly, I've tested both type types. and. It just depends on what the team learns from it and how they decide to move forward. Well, that's what I was wondering, if the learnings were consistently better in one scenario versus the other. It's tough to say. I mean, it, it, because it depends on the product so much, it's, it's more dependent on what the idea was or what the area is that you're exploring, I'd say. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. It depends. Yeah, like, you can have the same problem you're trying to solve, have some solutions that would work marginally well and others that don't work well at all. I think they both give you some sort of information that's a improve upon what you're trying to solve. <coughs> yeah, well, we should talk after this, for sure. Okay, okay. great. Thank you so much. <laughs>